Well, good morning. It's great to see you all. Uh, you can join me in turning the Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we have them all around the room under seats. And you can find Colossians 4 on page 985 in those Bibles. If you're newer to Zionsville uh, Fellowship, we take this time every Sunday uh, to hear from God's Word. So we do what uh, is referred to as expositional or expository preaching. The idea there is that uh, my job here is to expose us to God's Word. So we want to hear from God. We believe the Bible is God's very Word. And so we'll take a text of the Bible, and my job is to just be a servant, not to give you all of my thoughts and wisdom, but to serve you all um, by making the main point of the sermon, the main point of the text. And the main point of the text becomes the main point of the sermon. So we're hearing from God this morning from Colossians chapter 4, and the section we're looking at is verses 2 to 6. Uh, here, so we'll read this and then uh, pray together. Here's God's Word written by the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for giving us your word and bringing it to us this morning. We thank you for faithful English translation so that we can read this here as well. We also thank you for giving us minds for some to learn Greek and Hebrew, to understand your word in its uh, clarity as it was given. We thank you for the Holy Spirit's uh, presence to illuminate your word and help us understand it this morning. So we're praying this morning that you would do the things that we know you love to do, the things that we can't do on our own. So open our minds to understand your word, open our hearts to see and behold and love you in Christ. And we pray that you change us to make us more like Jesus and live more faithfully in accordance with the words that we just read. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the last message in our series, People for the World. Uh, we've been seeing how Christians are called to show and to share the love of Christ. So we started in the Old Testament a couple months ago, and we saw how Israel was called really to pick up the commission of Adam and Eve and humanity, but Israel was called to be a light to the nations, that they would attract the nations to the one true God through a kind of moral magnetism as they lived lives that reflected God's character in the world and spoke of His goodness. Israel uh, failed, and so we saw how prophets like Isaiah said that a new and true Israel would come to live this faithful life that Israel and humanity have failed to live. This true Israel would be a light to the nations, and we find that this would be one singular Israelite, one man who would come live this beautiful life, come to restore people to God, starting with Israelites and then people from every nation around the globe. He'd die in the place of his people, he'd rise again in victory, and he would be a light to the nations, and those whom he'd gather to himself, he would then send to be a light to the nations. So we saw that Jesus is that true servant, the true Israel, the light of the world. He lived this morally beautiful life that you and I have failed to live, that we just reflected on as we took the Lord's Supper. We saw that he died and rose so that we can be forgiven and restored to God. And so if you are a Christian, this has happened to you, you've received the forgiveness of sins, and you've been restored to God now and forever. If you are not yet a Christian, uh, He invites and even commands you to trust Him and receive this grace, receive this forgiveness because of His death and resurrection for us. And now Jesus saves His people, and He doesn't just forgive us. He gives us a great purpose, one of which, a central one of which, is to live as a light to the nations and to our neighbors and to live on mission. So this morning is um, a final charge of sorts. 
in this series. And we're going to see this in one of the final charges from one of the greatest evangelists ever. So Colossians 4 is a final charge within the letter of Colossians. Paul is drawing this letter to a close, and this is one of the most direct encouragements and commands for a life of evangelism in Paul's letters. So Paul has been showing how Christ in this letter is um, the Savior of the world, the King exalted over all things. In Him are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Um, We come to Him, and He is everything, and so we have everything in Him, and He changes our lives, and we live a new lifestyle because the, the new world, the new creation to come where all will be made new and all will be set right is broken into the present and we now can live a new kind of life. And so, after all of this, he's giving this final charge, and it's a vision for every Christian to live as a faithful witness to Jesus. So, this text shows us how we can apply this sermon series in our lives. We want to be a church that embraces Jesus' commission to make disciples. If you're a believer, you want to see other people come to know Jesus just as you have. You have found the greatest treasure in the world. And this treasure giver, who is the treasure himself, not only commands you, but gives you the privilege of sharing that with others. You want to see Jesus honored by having more and more people come under his good and loving rule. You love your neighbors and you care about their good. So many of you are in vocations and living in, in life and volunteering to bless and serve other people, and we want to do that for not only their temporary good in this life, but their eternal good also. You want to share the good news of Jesus just like you've received it. But if we're going to participate in Jesus' mission, then it has to affect three things. It has to affect how we pray, how we live and how we speak. So those are the three things that Paul draws attention to here. So this isn't going to be kind of a comprehensive summary of a series or everything that needs to be said or somehow getting uniquely practical. Um, This is really just looking at this final charge in Colossians as a final charge for our series and seeing how these three aspects of life need to be affected if we're going to live on mission. So Paul is showing us here how you as a believer and I can participate in Christ's mission in three ways related to how we pray, how we live, and how we speak. So let's consider each of these. First, how we pray. We participate in Christ's mission by praying for the gospel to spread. So Paul focuses on how our prayers should be used for the sake of mission here. But notice the very first thing he says, it's more general, but it's related to prayer for evangelism. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So, what does it mean to be watchful in prayer? Well, it means to be awake and alert, but Paul isn't just addressing the problem of literally falling asleep when you pray, though I've known people to do that. I have perhaps done that, certainly almost do that. So, if you need to receive a reminder to literally stay awake when you pray, receive it as that in part. Take a walk, stand up, pray out loud, whatever you need to do. But this isn't what Paul's mainly talking about here. He's also not talking about watching for answers to prayer, though that's a great thing to do as well. The language of watchfulness has to do with spiritual alertness. It's about being spiritually awake and not spiritually lethargic and complacent. The way I think it's helpful to think about is to say that this is being awake to reality, right, in all its depths. You're awake to what is really going on in the world, seen and unseen, and it's going to affect how you pray. So Jesus, when he was praying in Gethsemane, he told his disciples to be watchful or stay awake lest you fall into temptation. So he didn't say stay awake lest you fall asleep in prayer. It was lest you fall into temptation. He wasn't just warning them against sleepiness, but temptation. So, he also uses this language of staying awake and watch often to refer to his second coming, which isn't about literally looking at the skies, but it's about a spiritual alertness and wakefulness in light of his presence and coming. Paul uses this language in Ephesians 6 in the context of demonic and spiritual warfare that is against Christians right now. So, this is about being awake to spiritual reality. So here's how this helps us with prayer. 
and mission. We are often lethargic in prayer because we're lethargic spiritually. We're not paying attention to reality. So, are you awake to the spiritual war that's raging around you? Are you awake, meaning you think about this through the day? Are you awake to the reality that life is war and we're in a fight of faith to hold on to Christ and to fight sin and to fight for our joy in Him? Are you aware that the great needs of the world are urgent around us, spiritual needs, and the needs of orphans, the concerns for the sanctity of life, the reality of hell and a coming judgment, and the need for the gospel to spread. To the degree that you're awake to these realities, then you'll feel the urgency and you'll know that God alone can bring the lasting change in the world. And so we'll ask Him to spread the gospel in the world, in particular in the context of this text. So, Paul now shows us how we can participate then in evangelism through prayer. Look at verse 3. So, he goes on saying, at the same time, so just as you're praying with thankfulness and the spiritual alertness that's in tune to reality, pray also for us that God, and he's referring to himself and Timothy and other co-workers for the gospel, that God may open to us a door for the word, the gospel, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison. So, this man is in prison, and he's not asking them to pray that he gets out, but that the word would get out, right? He's not asking, pray that the prison doors would open for me, but he's saying, pray that the Lord would open a door for the gospel to spread. So, Paul uses this language of opening a door for the gospel often. It refers to new opportunities for the gospel to spread and take root in an area and in people's hearts and lives. And what's the message of the gospel? Well, the way he puts it here is in verse 3, he's speaking of declaring the mystery of Christ. So, the, the gospel was a mystery that was hidden, but in Christ it's now revealed. It's a message centrally about Jesus. It's that not that people should be good. It's not that people should get religion or that being a Christian makes life easy. It's the message of who Jesus is and what He's done in His perfect life his substitutionary death, his victorious resurrection, his present reign and kindness over his church, and his soon and coming return. And he invites us to trust him for the forgiveness of sins and to come under his kingship. So, we pray for doors to be opened for the message of Jesus to spread and take root. We also pray for Christians to speak the gospel clearly. That's what Paul asks also for in verse 4 now. He said, pray that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, which is amazing because Paul, one of the greatest evangelists in human history, certainly clear in his thinking and speaking, is dependent on God to help him be clear and speak clearly. And he's asking them even, pray that I may make it clear. So, in this first way, we participate in mission. We see that we participate through prayer. We do it by praying for the gospel to spread. So, God spreads the gospel in the world in response to the prayers of people, of you and I. God spreads the gospel in the world in response to prayer. That's how He's chosen for the gospel to advance. That explains also what was happening with the explosion of the Christian movement and the gospel in the first century. Christians devoted to prayer and devoted to speaking the gospel clearly. A pastor named Jack Miller put it this way in one of his collected letters. He said, the book of Acts, so the story of the early church, the book of Acts is the story of the acts of Christ done in history, and listen to this, in response to the constant corporate prayer by the leaders of the church. The early chapters of Acts follow a clear pattern. First, the church is pictured indoors, where prayer prevails. Then the church is pictured outdoors, where the Spirit of Christ prevails through preaching and mighty deeds. So, that's how revivals happen. That's how churches are planted. That's how churches grow. It's through praying for God to do what only He can do and for the gospel to spread, and then it's for… it happens through 
speaking the gospel to people and watching God answer our prayers and use our words as we speak the gospel. So this is why we don't put effort into trying to be a flashy or trendy church because we're not about just collecting people. Uh, We're not about just temporary happiness. We're about seeing God do what only He can do through His Word in response to the prayers of His people, which is why we want to be a church saturated with speaking to God and hearing from God. We pray and we speak His Word. So let's continue to grow as a praying church. This doesn't so much mean we add prayer to everything else we do. It doesn't mean we have, you know, all of these meetings and make sure we add a prayer one here or maybe two prayer meetings for every one kind of other meeting. Instead, it means that we integrate prayer into everything we do. So this is why we pray throughout our Sunday service and why we pray at leadership meetings and why we pray in small group meetings and as families and in friendships. Prayer and speaking to God, asking Him to do what only He can do as a normal part of our life. Very practically, here's a few things to consider that just naturally flow from the few verses we've seen so far. So first, pray in particular for our supported mission partners. One way to do this is to sign up online for our missions newsletter. Um, Our mission team sends this out and gives prayer requests from those who are living as a supported mission partner to spread the gospel. So pray verses 3 and 4 for our mission partners. Pray that God would open up doors for the gospel to spread through their ministry. Pray that God would give them clarity. Second, you can pray for our Sunday gathering. Pray on your way here that God would be at work in our midst to encourage us and strengthen us. Um, Pray as you leave that God would let His Word take root more in our lives and and let it… be applied to our lives in everyday life. I email a number of people every week who are committed to praying weekly for our gathering and for the preaching of God's Word. And so they're praying for God to do His work among us. They're praying for you all during this kind of time right here, praying through the week for this time. So if you want to commit to praying for the preaching each Sunday, just send me an email and I'll add you to that list. Third, pray for each other in your small groups. Share about and pray for opportunities to spread the gospel. So pray in light of verses 3 and 4. If you don't already, have part of what you do from time to time or every time you gather as a small group to just share and give updates about people in your life that you're praying for to receive the gospel and come to Jesus. And pray for one another in those opportunities. Let's partner together just as Paul's modeling here. He's saying, pray for me that I'd speak clearly and I'd have opportunities. So let's do that for one another. And then finally, use note cards or a prayer journal. Have some way to write down names of people that God has put in your life that you'd love to see the gospel spread to, and you'd love opportunities to be created for you or others to bring the gospel into their life. So first, we participate in Christ's mission with how we pray, and second, with how we live. Specifically, use every opportunity to help people know Jesus. That's verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. So this is referring to our lives as we engage with people Paul refers to as outsiders, which is just his way of often referring to people who are outside of Christ and the church. So they're not in Christ and united to him and his people. And so these are just people who are not yet Christians. And Paul's saying, as you live among them, live with wisdom. And in context, this is about living in a way that helps them come to know Jesus or hear the gospel of Jesus. So it's living in a way that's helpful for sharing the gospel. It's about living among people in a way that's conducive for them to learn about Jesus. So God has placed you in a certain network of relationships that's different than anyone else here. There's overlapping spheres, but each one of you has a unique set of relationships in your family, your neighborhood, your coworkers, another group you're involved in. And 
He's placed you there for the sake of living wisely for the gospel. And so, what does this look like specifically? Well, look at the next race. Making the best use of the time. So, that metaphor means that you make the most of every opportunity. Now, it's at this point where I want to give some statement like when I say use, make the best use of time or use every opportunity, I just want to say I'm not using hyperbole. Um, this is, I'm just trying to say what Paul is saying here, but this, is over, this is, it can be overwhelming. This is a pretty radical life orientation change, isn't it? Make the best use of the time. Take every opportunity living wisely among those who don't know Jesus. Always be ready to share with people, to engage with people, to befriend them, to talk about what matters with hopes ultimately you speak about what matters most ultimately, looking for opportunities to speak directly about Jesus. So this is saying that we should always be identifying opportunities around us to share Christ and looking to wisely engage with people. So there's probably way more opportunities than we're aware of. This is really helpful for me just this past week, thinking about this text and realizing just how many opportunities there really are. Um, sometimes I've been in conversations with people and I felt this way too. It's like, Lord, give me an opportunity today. And I'm like, where might it be? You know, there are so many opportunities. This is a way of living. And we're actually pretty good at identifying opportunities to do things that we love. Think about it. Some people love comfort and relaxation. They're always looking for opportunities to take a break and they find them. They work less get away on vacation, always looking for opportunities and making it happen. Some people love watching sports, so they're always looking for opportunities to watch a game, to go to a game, to be at a game, to join a team, and they're really good at making the best use of those opportunities. Other people love food, and they're always looking opportunity for opportunities to eat or to find a new place to go. Other people love playing golf, and somehow they find very large gaps in their schedule to play a lot of golf. The point is we are really good at finding opportunities for the things that we love. And Paul is saying, Christian, are you captivated by Christ? Do you see Him as the one who created, through whom God created all things, and He upholds all things, and He's over all things? Everything exists for Christ. That's what Paul said earlier in the letter, that He might be preeminent. In Him are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you have Christ, you have everything. Do you see Him as the one who loves you with an infinitely deep love and is committed to your good? And do you love others enough to want them to know that Jesus? Do you love them enough to want to look for opportunities? to befriend them and introduce them to the friendship of Jesus. If you do, you'll find opportunities. You'll see them. And the command here is to make the best use of time. Live with real wisdom, living for what really matters. So think about it. Just a couple examples. Parents, you have opportunities all the time if you have kids in your home. None of them come into this life with a new heart yet. They need you to teach them about Jesus. They need you to pray for them, for God to give them a new heart. And you have opportunities all the time to talk about Jesus, or you have an opportunity to restructure life because you've structured life in such a way that removes opportunity to talk about Jesus. You can find a daily time to read the Bible and pray together. It doesn't have to be complicated. Work your way through books of the Bible, read a section, ask what stood out, pray together in light of it. You can prioritize meals together and use that time to talk about what really matters in life. You can encourage one another to read God's Word on their own, and then find time to just share what you're learning in God's Word. Ask them what's standing out to them or if they have any questions about what they're learning. There's often opportunities right before bed with little kids. That's certainly earlier, so my kids are still at the age when they want to talk before bed early on. I heard someone recently say something like, at bedtime, every kid becomes a dehydrated, dehydrated philosopher who needs just one more hug, um, which is true. Yeah, 
Chase is waving his hand. It's true. Um, so sometimes we do just need to shut it down. Um, but there are, there's an opportunity right there. Yes, you may be an exhausted parent, but what a moment of eternal significance to have a child ready in a quiet room, curious, often sincerely curious um, about what they're asking. There may be many moments when you get to talk about things and then pick them up in coming days. You create rhythms in life, but you can also take advantage of just random moments in life, drawing attention to God and His goodness and what He's doing for us. Every moment, every good gift is a blessing from Him, and you can thank Him together for those kinds of things. And with older kids, you can be available later at night to talk. So I've, I'm not there yet, but I've learned from uh, some of you how you were intentional as your kids start coming home more at like midnight, um, and they're ready to talk, and you wish you were in bed at 930 Um, But I've learned from some of you that you are committed to when there's opportunity, just stay up and talk with them. Ask them about their day. What a great opportunity to talk about the things that matter. Um, Grandparents, you have opportunities to speak to your grandkids about Christ, to read them stories, to tell them your own story of how you came to know Christ. Adoption is a great way to have not just one opportunity, but a lifetime of opportunities to show the love of Christ and share the love of Christ with someone. And there's such a great need for this. Millions of kids need parents. And maybe the Lord would have you adopt that He might bring His love into a child's life. We have opportunities in our neighborhoods. God has planted you where you live for a reason. You may be the only Christian around some people. So how can you use every opportunity to help them know Christ? What next step can you take in befriending people or serving people or loving people or bringing up Jesus? We have opportunities at our workplaces. We can get to know our coworkers at a deeply personal level and befriend them and then talk about the things that matter in life and then just be authentically a real Christian in front of them, speaking about the things that matter to you, which Christ will be the center of. Every Sunday is an opportunity. Consider inviting a friend to join us. Come early and stay longer. One of the reasons to do that is not just to engage with each other, but to look for someone who's lonely. Look for someone who's new. Befriend them. Who knows what the Lord may do? And then using Sundays to talk about what God has done in this time. Talk about the message and the the text that we looked at from the Bible. Talk about it over lunch or sometime in the afternoon. Share what stood out to you. Ask what was challenging to a family member or friend. We could keep going. Here's the point. God has given us a life to live as a gift, and He gives us both a responsibility and a privilege to use it wisely. It's not to be hoarded and spent on ourselves. It's to be used to help people come to know their Creator and find their joy in Him. So Christ's mission affects how we pray, how we live, and finally, how we speak. It's not just what we say that's important. It's how we say it. We need to communicate Christ clearly, but also kindly. This is verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious. That's countercultural. Seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Evangelism is still in view here. This is about speaking to people, outsiders, people about Jesus, As we live wisely, as we make the best use of time looking for opportunities to share Christ, we will engage in a dialogue with people, maybe a dialogue in one conversation or over the course of days, months, years, decades. And Paul's main concern here is with the tone of our conversation. He says our speech should always be gracious. And the phrase seasoned with salt adds to the picture. Salt was used as a flavor enhancer like it is today. It was a common metaphor in Paul's time for enjoyable speech. So Paul is saying Christians should be known for their gracious, kind, attractive conversation about spiritual matters. It's striking just how much the New Testament is concerned about the tone of the Christian's speaking. Even in disagreement, our speech should always be gracious. Well, what about when we differ on politics? Always be gracious. 
Well, what about if they're rude to me? Always be gracious. What about if I'm on Facebook or Twitter or X as it's called? Always be gracious. No matter the conversation topic, no matter the context, always be gracious. That itself is radically countercultural and attractive. It's a way we show and demonstrate the love of Christ as we speak. It's not the tone of social media. It's not the tone of news shows and news podcasts. It's not the tone of many Christians when they do speak. Our political polarization creates a kind of tribalization and warfare mentality. Even just news headlines, from wherever you get them, they're manipulative, they hide things, they shade truth, they're spin. If you're only reading from one news place or one end of a political spectrum, if you are not very aware that you are being manipulated, then you are being manipulated. Um, it helps just to pick them across the spectrum so you can just see the way in which headlines and articles are written very uncharitably toward a view that disagrees with them and using language very manipulatively. And Christians will stand out as we just speak truly, honestly, clearly, and graciously. And graciousness is a non-negotiable. Paul says we do this. As we do this, we also need to know how you ought to answer each person, as he put it here. So he's assuming there very well may develop a back-and-forth conversation. We're not just preaching at people. We're talking with them. We're responding to questions. We're gracious all the way through. Some of you are really good at this. I've learned from your example. And if you're not very good at this, recognize that this isn't just a personality thing. It's not like, oh yeah, that person, such a gracious person, that's just not me. I'm more of a fighter. No. Always be gracious, even if you do have a bit of a, a, a bold instinct. We should be bold and gracious. I mean, these aren't contradictions. Just take Jesus, take Paul, take it all whole. Bold, courageous, clear, kind, gracious. It all fits together. And so learn from one another. So as you see someone who's really good at this, um, learn from them. And you know, it's interesting, some people that we can tend to think just have this kind of personality. Oh, that person's just that kind of person. If we know their story, now some of you in this room are like this. If we know your story, we would know that that actually isn't your default personality. You were not like that. The Lord has changed you. And now you are so gracious that some people think, oh, easy for them. That's just natural for them, but you know, no, it isn't. This took a lot of work, and this took the Lord's miracle in my life, and the Lord can do it for you if you're on the other side of that miracle. So if you think you have room to grow, here's just even one idea. Memorize this verse and ask God to bring it to your mind throughout the day, right? Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each person. Write it on a note card. Tape it to your computer screen. If you tend to engage in emails or social media in a way that doesn't fit this, uh, take a screenshot of it. Pull the Bible app up, screenshot this verse, have it as your background, and pray that the Lord would etch this on your mind and write it on your heart. All right, so let's wrap up here. All through the Bible, we've seen through the series that God calls His people and His church to be a people for the world. So when you become a Christian, you get a new identity as a witness to Christ and a new purpose to witness to Christ. You're called to be a faithful witness. And this identity and privilege is relevant to every moment of your life. When you come to Christ, you do not have a purposeless life. You do not merely just have forgiveness and then go find your purpose elsewhere. This is at the heart of your purpose. It's being a light to the world, showing people the love of Christ, reflecting the love of Christ, speaking of the love of Christ. And so if we're going to embrace this, it's got to affect how we pray, how we live, and how we speak. We pray for the gospel to spread. So evangelism is what we do, but giving new hearts is what only God can do. So we pray for Him to work. We live differently, so we use every opportunity to speak about Christ because He's the point of all things, and He chose to have us share about Him. And we let our speech always be gracious because our tone should match the message. 
We aren't just sharing a message of Christ's love to then be contradicted by the way we treat the people we talk with. We share a message of Christ's love, and we embody and we picture that love to them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your clear word here. We thank you for its relevance and its inspiring vision for life. And we are hopeful that you've been at work in our minds and hearts and changing our wills in this time here in your word. And so we pray that as we go here, you would let this word continue to take root and that the roots would go deeper and deeper in our hearts and lives and that this would create a flowering effect in our lives and church family. We thank you for how you have been doing this in so many people's lives in this church family and through the witness of this church over the decades. And we pray for you to do it all the more. Help us not turn inward, but continue to be outward. Help us to be oriented toward you and your goodness and reflect that to others. We pray in the midst of all sorts of challenges, personally and in life and in our culture and in relationships, that you would help us to be steadfast in prayer, wisely living among outsiders, and always speaking with graciousness. In Jesus' name, amen.